Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the first of four tours that are going to accompany this year's members exhibition, which is titled Tours Resilience Art in the Time of Pandemia. I'm very happy to welcome you here today, but also to introduce the first four artists that will be talking with us today. We have Joan Beer, we have Jolie Dolbersma, we have Sue Wolf, and we have Neil Berkowitz. Just to give you a sense of how things are going to go, they are going to speak near and reference their painting just so you can get a sense of who has done what. And we'll go through just some basic reflections on their work, how the time of making during this pandemic, how they have experienced that, going into some of the ideas that they um, are interested in and that are reflected in their painting. And then we'll reconvene as a group to take on a group discussion about some of those same issues. We would love to take questions from the audience at that point as well. Hi, I'm Jody Oldersmaw, and this is my piece, Like a Reed in the Wind. And uh, originally the idea came from the book Dune, and the uh, protagonist in Dune was in a battle, and he had to defeat this guy and instead of using force against the guy. He let himself fall backward. And the act of allowing yourself to fall into something sometimes can allow you to win. So for me, this was kind of um, about dualities. And uh, I had seen these videos on the internet about rabbits. And we have these ideas of rabbits as like, you know, they're weak and they're mild and that sort of thing. But um, apparently the mother rabbits fight and kill poisonous snakes. And they do it all the time to protect their offspring. So after seeing these videos where it just kind of like blew my mind that, we, that these animals aren't like this passive thing, that they can defend themselves, that the whole binary of predator prey isn't quite what we think it is. And for me, this is about resilience. This is about knowing that you can defend yourself, that you can have boundaries, that you can also survive, and that survival looks different for different animals. And um, so um, for me, it, it goes into all the binaries that we've created. And right now, I feel like we're in this time where we're getting a chance to re-examine the binaries, that, you know, these extreme ideas of black and white. And so now we can start seeing grays. We can start seeing nuance in how, you know, we approach all the different things in our society. We have an opportunity here to rebuild things and to hear people that we haven't heard before, to re-examine assumptions we have about different types of people. Hi, my name is Joan Beer, and this is my piece, 891, Witness 89112. Um, and the whole Witness series, I started five or six years ago, and it was about witnessing what exists and um, just being with it. And I think that it, it started really with witnessing people, primarily um, women identified people, understanding that there's a lot of complexity to identity and that the traditional portrait doesn't really play that out. So um, when the pandemic came, um, portraiture was put on hold, except for people that are in my family. And um, I was really liberated to spend a lot more time delving into my photographing of nature. And I found an incredible refuge just going down to the beach every day and spending time there. And one of the things that I don't know or I didn't know about the West Coast was what is the impact of climate change on um, the environment? because I grew up on the East Coast and there's a lot of things that are similar and there are a lot of things that are different. But one of the things that um, very, was very prevalent when I was a child growing up in Maine was coralline algae. And it's almost like a glue on rocks. It allows plants to grow from them. It's a source of life for a lot of the beings that are there. And I was wondering like, well, why, why am I not seeing it? And um, the reason is obviously climate change. Um, and so I decided to, in the practice of witness, accept that and photograph what was there. And so I 
spent a lot of time and I was noticing that the, we don't have this range of color in seaweed um, that I witnessed on the East Coast, but we have it here. So I was spending a lot of time photographing and one day I just felt called to look behind me and I saw these huge um, strands of seaweed waving in the air like, I, I thought they looked like gay pride flags to me. Um, so I just was like, okay, I'm gonna try to get over there. And when I got there, I was photographing them and I looked at my camera to check how the focus and all that was going. And I noticed that there was coralline algae. So I had sort of let something go and then it came back. So um, to bring this around to uh, something that I think about a lot, which is what is the intersection between um, climate and racial justice, um, in that moment of finding the coralline algae, I experienced a great sense of peace and connection. And it became really clear to me over the next few months as that experience resonated that self-care and connection with nature, with people, but primarily with ourselves, starting with ourselves, is a way in which we can create the space for change because we all know there are so many things that we need to do on every front, pick your issue. But um, without having that sense of gravity in, inside yourself, that, and I mean gravity in terms of like, I'm connected to where I'm standing, it's so much harder to act. So um, I was surprised and delighted to be able to experience that and, and to look at my photographs as a way of reflecting a way of nature being a source of, uh, you know, the most basic connection we have because we are a part of nature and nature is inside of us. And um, I'm just really grateful to be in this show and to be with all these other talented artists. Right, so I'm Suze Wolf, and uh, I have been painting burned over forests and burned trees, large portraits of individual burned trees for about 13 going on 14 years now. Seamed here is number 44. So, uh, and this tree obviously had run into some difficulty or some constraints uh, before it was burned. The puckering and the seams tell you that it had met with some adversity. So in a way, the pandemic didn't change my focus at all. The climate, this is a way to me to talk about climate, uh, since I think we're still facing a six-fold increase in the number of uh, large-scale fires in, the, uh, in North America. But the pandemic definitely increased my focus. It increased the amount of time I could be outdoors, uh, be in nature, which for me has always been a, uh, a, a way to find resilience, it is to get out there. Uh, but over the course of my lifetime, I have been an outdoor person on the Cascades and my entire life. I kept seeing all these changes and feeling like I had to witness and report to them, report back what I was seeing. So that's how the series began. Uh, the one thing the pandemic did help me focus even further on, uh, this height is the height of a roll of watercolor paper, or the width of the roll. And so 47 uh, now of the trees, 48, have been this size, various widths. But during the pandemic, with so much time alone uh, and to focus, I painted one that's almost the uh, length of a roll of watercolor paper. It's 21 and a half feet long. And that took a lot of focus and a lot of uh, resilience on my part to do. And I'm, I'm quite proud of it. And all of them have given me a way of talking to people. Uh, all the places that I have shown them, every time I get to be there or deliver some talk together with some of the people I have collaborated with, foresters, scientists, poets, all kinds of people. It's been a wonderful chance to talk to people uh, and I find them moved 
and very, very uh, committed. And so I hope that that's something that can make some difference. Uh, I listened to a talk not long ago by Amy Snover, who is the head of the Climate Impacts Group at the University of Washington. And it, went, it was a very well done interview. Uh, the interviewer asked her questions like, are you teaching your son to ski? Uh, and, you know, very personal, very uh, revealing kinds of answers. And at one point she said, I used to feel that nothing I could do would make any difference. Uh, and she said she had reframed that for herself to uh, the only thing that uh, matters is what I can do. And when someone asked her, well, what kinds of things can we do? She had a long list of different activities, and I'm happy to say that painting was one of them. So I have likewise reframed it for myself as something I can do. So I'm Neil Berkowitz, and I want to start by thanking Coco for putting together this exhibition. I find when I'm faced with thematic exhibitions, I really start to consider a lot of things that I wouldn't normally consider. And it really widens my scope as I do things. So uh, I'm glad to be a part of the exhibit, and I thank you for being part of the exhibit. Uh, this work is interesting, but I'm going to backtrack and just say I've been doing, making photographs for more than 60 years. And one of the things that's been constant in that period is the sense that I think the most important thing that my work is about is paying attention. And that means that anything is fair game as far as subject matter. So I take a lot of uh, photographs now with my iPhone because I have it with me and I'm as interested in what I see on a neighborhood walk as I am in a museum or, uh, uh, or right in this room. So this is a work that reflects the pandemic first because it's at this three layers and virtually all of my uh, two-dimensional work is layered photography of my own images, sometimes layering in traditional printmaking as well in different uh, orders, but I love the zoo. I hadn't been to the zoo in years before the pandemic. It was the safest place to walk in Seattle during the pandemic. They nailed one-way paths. Uh, I never saw in all my walks there unmasked people. Uh, it, they just did a terrific job. So. This particular content is content that I wouldn't have had available to work with had it not been for the pandemic. So maybe there were doors open that uh, wouldn't have, that, that I wouldn't have taken the initiative to open otherwise. But what we're looking at is one layer of a penguin swimming in captivity and actually a couple of botanical layers uh, uh, as well. And I look at this and I think of going back to, to paying attention. And one of the driving forces in all of my work is trying to suggest the sense of the need to look at things more deeply. So I don't know how many folks looked at this and said, oh, a penguin which isn't really the issue, but looking to see and to ask the question, what is it that I'm looking at? And recognizing that this whole thing is a made thing. And that if it's there, there may have been some intention on my part to put it there. And what, what does that suggest to you? So uh, I really love doing the layering because it allows for opportunities like that. It also allows me to be more intentional earlier. So I shoot layers like the foliage, uh, the, the, the plants, uh, that wouldn't stand alone as, as a photograph, but work to give a sense of this place. So it combines 
They were all taken on the same visit, by the way. So this is the way that we form our understanding of places and events is by making the connections between those. We go for a hike. We don't, we, we think of, you know, this viewpoint and that viewpoint. And, but when we finally got to take a break and, and just rest for a couple of minutes, but the experience doesn't make sense until we fill in what was in between and what connected those experiences. So I think of layering in that way too. Uh, I will also add that you know, in thinking about resiliency uh, for today, as well as for the exhibition, I come to realize that resiliency is not always a positive thing. Resiliency is being able to bounce back from pressure. And some of that bouncing back is because we give in and endure the things that are pressing upon us and trying to find that line. So I, I want to do more work that looks at finding that line between when it's good and right uh, uh, to survive uh, and just make it through, and when you need to come up with different strategies and approaches. And I've started to think about uh, uh, some 3D sculptural things that use memory foam to question whether things really return to normal or not uh, after a period of resiliency. Thank you all so much for your uh, individual uh, sharing around your work and all of that. Again, thank you also for your participation in the exhibition. Um, I wanted to kick off our group discussion by asking you guys to share in um, in terms of your overall artistic practice. The we're exiting the second year of the pandemic and entering year three, unfortunately, but nonetheless there has been a lot of necessary changes that um, all of us have had to deal with personally and professionally. And so where your professional practice is concerned, I'm wondering what it is that you have noticed over these two years that you've had to leave behind in terms of your artistic practice, whether it be certain ways of working, materials, um, access, what are some of those aspects of your practice or materials, actual materials that perhaps you've had to leave behind, or even if you didn't, you weren't being forced to leave it behind, you, after some reflection, you're just like, this just doesn't make sense anymore, this just doesn't matter anymore. I think for uh, me, you know, I've definitely felt like there's been a loss of community. Mm -hmm. You know, it's trying to reestablish that for myself and making sure that that I make the effort to reach out, connect people virtually, you know, just like not having the opportunities to go see shows or keeping virtual or not being able to go to museums. And it definitely, you know, makes it so you have to look more online or in books or, you know, try and connect to the people that you are connected to. So I think it's just trying to maintain you know, picking and choosing which relationships really are getting me where I want to go and where the visions are, you know, helping each other. So I think it's just about making sure that that community stays intact and continues to build that. Thank you. Whoever wants to take the floor, that's the I, If I've left anything behind, it's certainty. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I don't take much of anything for granted quite the same way. And I think in terms of uh, my artistic practice, it isn't so much the execution as uh, what happens after that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure we all have the experience of having something sit in a closed mm -hmm. space somewhere for months at a time not according to the original plan. And I guess I have to say that I do believe in the philosophically that the viewer completes the work. Mm -hmm. That if, if it is not being seen, it, ha it hasn't been completed. Mm -hmm. And so for me, not knowing whether something is going to be seen, or if, or when, or how, mm -hmm. um, 
it, it certainly has been a challenge. And I find myself wanting to read fiction and nonfiction from other times when humans have been extremely uncertain and anxious. Well, I, I agree with a lot of the things that have been said about community and wanting to work in the scene. But um, I just, like, when I first heard you asking the question, the, the idea of uncertainty and the idea of huge transition, I think that um, that's something I want to take forward. I think that like, embracing that, especially when we're trying to deal with a lot of huge problems, social and climate-wide, that like thinking about pivoting quickly, that's amazing. Uh, thinking about things from different perspectives, that's amazing. And also, um, I find like now with a lot of people being vaccinated and, and there's an opportunity to be in person and to go and see things, and that's being developed. And don't just, I don't have anything specifically, but I think it's good to rethink things. So now, this is kind of cool. We're here, this is a small group. It's just four of us, so we get to hear each other. That's an awesome thing. Maybe we'll get better at taking advantage uh, of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Well put. Thank you, Kevin. And I would add that when I think of the things that I've been unable have needed to change to mm -hmm. fall into laws, uh, one is the fact that I do my work starts out with my camera and then moves to a computer. From a computer, it moves to a rather expensive printer that I don't want to own uh, or maintain. And so I normally do my own printing. I spent essentially 15 or 16 months not being able to complete anything in the way that I think of it as a And because the layering also really brings out a, 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 a range of color is a challenging gamut to print. It's been difficult to produce, but not complete. Uh, on the other hand, and I've also given up projects that I wanted to work on. I'm really interested in interactive experience on, on the part of the uh, audience. And if it's a virtual audience, you can't have folks take miniature stuff of the work on display and reorganize it into an order that mm -hmm. uh, makes the most sense to them and then share a picture of that. That's the kind of thing. That's, you know, that's in a whole mm -hmm. uh, and is back, I hope, to be something that I will mm -hmm. get done in the next six months. Uh, but I've also found this online that compensate for a lot of that. It struck me, I don't know what Joan would I recommend a scene from Edwards, please? No. Okay. Well, we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, an incredible group. Mm -hmm. Been around for 20 years. Okay. Artists and scientists who work on collaborations dealing with primarily the materials of the environment. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just incredible content. So I found things that enrich my experience too, maybe not directly as a producer. So it's, you know, it's like life. You know, next year would always be different than previous year. This way, this compulsion where we're restricted, but difference is part of life. Thank you for sharing that. Um, in thinking about the theme um, of the exhibition as proposed by the call, how do you see your work interacting with some of your fellow artists' work? Like, what are some of the, when you've taken a look at the exhibition, um, what are some of the conversations you see arising, um, whether it be between your piece and other artists' pieces or among other artists' pieces? What are some of those sub-conversations or things that arise for you when you take a look at the exhibition? Um, I think for me, you know, I think the different takes on resilience mm -hmm. is very interesting mm -hmm. and kind of uh, the different approaches of survival. Okay. And for me, that's kind of the takeaway that I'm seeing and just how people, where they're focusing their attention right now. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I, I really a lot of what you said, Sue, resonated for me a lot because um, I just spend a lot of time at nature, in nature, and, and observing it. And I feel like um, it's wonderful to to be with a kindred spirit who's who's just out there, kind of hanging out by yourself in nature. Um, and hearing you speak about it, I, I learned a lot about the piece. I think the thing that's really nice is the way that the the way the exhibit is set up. The pieces speak to each other and they're little mini conversations of what's next to each other. Like this piece might be calling over, you know, to, to another piece. I think it can speak to the your rabbit piece. Um, so there's just that kind of the thing that visual art does when it's in a space with other pieces is they create echoes and it's cool. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I I think that when I look at some of the things here, they flesh out some of the things that I've been thinking about but hadn't really paid attention to in my thoughts. And so particularly the quote mm -hmm. stands out for me mm -hmm. because you know part of resilience is cultural resilience mm -hmm. and traditions uh, and holding on and keeping passing on those traditions. But it's also the comfort of tradition 